Okay, well, welcome to the second episode of uh, uh, our bi-weekly um, podcast in uh, politics, on politics around the world, um, as discussed in the first episode. Um, this is indeed a bi-weekly podcast that looks at politics around the world uh, through a non-partisan prism and mostly from the perspective of uh, comparative politics and political philosophy, but not only. And of course, we have certain themes that are more... Um, uh, closely uh, of interest uh, for us, um, as I mentioned last time. Uh, some of them will pop up uh, in today's episode as well. So in each episode we will deal with one or two major subjects and then uh, a smaller issue, I mean a smaller subject uh, in terms of length uh, of time that we spend on it. Um, usually maybe it's a book, it's a movie, it's something of interest, maybe something funny that I found. Uh, today, so in this episode, um, we will deal with one major item and then with two documentaries that I found of interest. And the major item is something that has been in the news, uh, namely uh, the recent uh, development in uh, Myanmar or Burma, as you want to call it, uh, however you want to call it. Um, and... Um, what do you know? What do we know about what happened? Uh, I mean, most recently, right? There were some elections in, um, I think, November last year. Um, but what happened most recently is that um, uh, there was a coup uh, done by the same military leaders who basically led Burma for about 30, no, actually 50 years, uh, 40 to 50 years. Um, this was an unexpected development. Uh, only 24 hours before um, these uh, happenings, they uh, assured everyone that they wouldn't uh, do anything like that. Um, and since then, there have been street protests and regime repression and so on. And this sounds like, you know, um, something that we hear fairly often. You know, there's an oppressive regime and there's a, there are uh, popular protests against it. I mean, that's the very, very simplified narrative but of course, the reality is not as simple. Uh, not that it's not true, this, you know, this contrast between an oppressive regime and a popular uprising, but the reality of Burma itself, or Myanmar, uh, is not as simple. And this is why and when it becomes uh, interesting uh, to us. Uh, and of course, you also know, probably, or you've heard of Aung, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, who, who a Nobel Prize winner, uh, was uh, in opposition to the junta, right, to the military regime for, for decades, uh, became head of the executive sort of uh, when this recent transition to democracy started in the last 10 years. Uh, her party won the elections last year. Now she's again in sort of house arrest. Um, but she also became controversial, uh, well, quote-unquote controversial, uh, some a couple of years ago when there was um, uh, basically a, 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 an attempt at ethnic cleansing, a sort of, um, some people said, genocide against one, one of the populations in Burma uh, or Myanmar, the Rohingya Muslims, the regime basically forced them to, uh, to enter a mass exodus to, to neighboring Bangladesh, um, about 700,000 people almost maybe a million people, left the country. And she, this famous opposition leader who used to oppose uh, the junta and was a democratic, uh, you know, icon and so on, kind of remained silent. And why did she remain silent? And if you read the, the press, you would see that, oh, well, she's kind of tarnished, her image is tarnished. Well, actually not, not within Burma. Her party won overwhelmingly. She's, she's uh, quite liked, I mean, overwhelmingly liked in, in Burma. So that hints to the fact that things are a bit more complicated and complex, as it usually happens, than what you know the surface narratives would tell us. And it's not because there's something secret behind, uh, but um, you know, reality in itself is more complex. And as I, as I mentioned last time, our goal in, in this podcast is to understand. Yeah, is to, to, to advance our understanding, especially of different societies and what happens within them. So um, perhaps the sort of the overarching theme of, 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 of today's discussion would be, would be the question of, of what is Burma or what is Myanmar? Literally, what is a Burma or what is a Myanmar? And I think that, that asking that question and, and seeing how difficult to answer it is 
kind of gives us more insight into the, the, the complexity of the situation and the, into the real nature of the situation. I mean, it's not secret, but just need to, you just need to dig and to use the right tools to, to analyze it. So um, what I would suggest is that we, 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 we kind of do an overview of, of what is this, this thing, Burma, where does it come from, and what have been the developments to understand actually the situation um, on, the, on the ground. Uh, and in order to do that, um, let's, uh, let's look at, um, let's look at first of, of, uh, at, at where, is, uh, where is Burma now, right? So I hope you see what I'm seeing, uh, which is um, a map of, um, uh, of Asia, right? So let me um, try to... Um, um, magnify it and where is Burma so if you look at Burma um, or Myanmar we're going to talk about the name in a second you see that it it is um, neighbors China it neighbors India it neighbors Bangladesh uh, Thailand Laos um, um, yeah these are the countries that it that it uh, it neighbors which will tell you something already about its history, right? Because what do we know about its, this area, right? Uh, India being so close, right? Clearly you would assume that, well, the history of what today is called uh, Myanmar or Burma uh, clearly needs to be linked with, with uh, British colonialism, right? Uh, in, in one way or the other. So let's see, let's see how, how this happened. And um, I'm actually going to check to make sure that you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, yes, you are. Good. Um, so, uh, let, let us just go um, and uh, do a very, very brief uh, excursion through, uh, through history. Uh, brief, very brief, in the sense of uh, seeing where this, where this entity called Burma uh, came about. So, here's, here's the map today, right? So, there you have Myanmar. Um, but let's, let's just jump back, um, because otherwise we would obviously not understand what, what is a Burma. Is there such a thing as Burma, and how could there be such a thing as Burma? Um, so if you go to 300 AD, you see um, some Mon uh, population here. So that's going to be a theme, right? The theme is going to be the fact that there are many... Uh, strands and of populations, languages, cultures, as throughout Asia, as throughout the world, as throughout Africa, but also in this in this uh, region. Uh, so here's a 300. I think it will be at uh, around 400 or 500. Um, um, let's see. That the um, maybe it's 500. The, that the, uh, an important uh, different population will enter that territory. Let's see. 500. 600. Well, we're still there. Um, seven. Oh. Mm, eight. AD, uh, and you notice that, you know, you have these white spots, but obviously these white spots, as um, I uh, usually say, doesn't mean that it's, there's snow there on the ground or there's nobody. It just knows that we don't know what kind of cultures and civilizations there were. But this is the point where I wanted to get. It's this, um, this uh, um, circle here, which obviously wasn't a circle. It just says that we don't know exactly the limits of, of how, this, uh, how far this culture expanded. Um, extended, so what is called pagan, yeah? So this was, this was the Bamar population, um, which, which moved, I think, from the northwest into this territory and will kind of take over and incorporate the previous Mon culture. And today, the name Burma comes from this Bamar uh, sort of ethnic group, yeah, which is, which is uh, uh, forms a good portion of Burma, but a good portion, but not all of it. And this is, this is the key. This is why a, a review of history, sort of a very brief, brief thing, will, will help us understand. Because today's Burma, today's Burma, and I'm going to jump back to, to today's Burma. Um, so here's the map of, uh, 
of, of Asia, right, that we looked at, right? Um, today's Burma, here's the ethnic map of today's Burma, yeah? So that kind of tells you something. That Burma, according to uh, various uh, statistics, has, well, disputable statistics, has about 135 ethnic groups. Now, this is a disputed statistic because actually it... We don't have clear um, uh, information about this, but it just tells you, just the number, that there is a tremendous ethnic diversity, ethnic tribal diversity in this, in, just in this country. So that's why I'm asking, so what is this Burma? Now you see here the Bamar population um, that, we, that we mentioned. Um, the, the Bamar population that you know, came down, you know, what was it, the, the 10th century, um, or their ancestors, right? But they form just one portion of the many, many ethnic groups in today's Burma or Myanmar. Uh, and as I mentioned that 135 is a disputed number, it's, it's not even a disputed number, it's, it's, it is fairly agreed that, um, well, this number comes from the British colonial times where they did this sort of a quasi, semi, scientific sort of uh, semi-amateurish um, sort of estimation of uh, the various ethnic and tribal groups, but using various criteria. And in fact, you know, if you look at, if you think of it, uh, you know, to, to um, uh, you know, to define an ethnic, ethnocultural group, uh, that's not very easy uh, in the sense that, you know, the, their definitions, there are many components that can, that can come into uh, the definition. Um, right in certain places it's language but in other places they speak the same language but they have a different religion and yet they're different ethnic groups so there are all these different criteria that can come into play and form different um, ethnicities so 135 is a is a very vague number and in fact in 2014 they tried to do another an actual census to actually have an idea of who are the ethnic groups uh, populating the, the, the country for and actually the results were never published, and I'm going to explain why for for that because it would have been it would have been very um, it would have been very contentious, leading even to uh, a violent conflict, uh, and we're going to talk about why. But it, I just wanted you to have a sense of okay, so this is uh, this is Burma today, yeah, uh, in terms of its ethnic uh, distribution, broadly speaking. Um, so we don't have a clear number of how many ethnic groups uh, there are there. And, uh, but we have an estimation and we have a clear impression of the fact that there are many different ethnic groups. So that already leads us further on this path to, to, to addressing the question with which, we started, with which we started, which is what is a Burma? What is Burma? Is there such a thing as Burma? Um, okay. So, so uh, quickly back to this historical uh, uh, overview. Again, we're not going to spend much time on it, uh, but it's good to um, have just a sense. And I'm gonna, we're going to just jump to the more recent development that led to the formation of the modern state of, of Myanmar. But let's just go. So 1200. Um, there you go. You see, there's this major pagan empire, which is uh, Bamar, mostly dominated. Um, then, what was it, 1600, I think, was, a, was another period where you had a, a larger, um, um, you know, a stronger political force there. But, you know, you don't have states in the sense of, of the modern states as we have them today, right? So that they didn't have actual, you know, uh, strict control over the territory and the population. Notice that the coast is, is, is separate. These entities, whatever they were, they were, they fluctuated all the time. Many times the whole territory was disputed among different warlords and uh, um, f um, competing princes, just like in the Indian subcontinent, right? There's no such thing as India until the 20th century. Right, it has always been, uh, you know, uh, uh, hundreds and thousands, hundreds or thousands of competing principalities, local powers, power holders, villages, whatever. This, uh, because what? Because because this idea of the modern state is first of all, as we know them today, the, the states as we know them today. First of all, they emerge in, in Western Europe, and and um, um, so that's one thing. And then they're exported uh, uh, sort of everywhere. Um, 
uh, because of the colonialism. Um, and uh, they really become a norm internationally only in the 19th, uh, 20th century. But why? Because the modern state is so effective that everybody starts imitating, oh, we need to have a modern state. Well, why would you have a modern state? Centralized, whatever, or with a central authority when you could live quietly in your village without being under a state, right? Remember, we discussed this last time as well. Um, you know, uh, political reality is, 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 is man-made, yeah? There's no necessity in it, uh, except for you know certain aspects that that that, that have to do with uh, human nature, but nothing has to happen, right? So when we examine these things, we we the, the the value of understanding how things develop and and emerge is to understand that things can go differently and will go differently in the future, and especially the fact that today the way we live today is not the only way and it's not definitive, yeah. In, uh, 10,000 years, things will look different. Um, we always think, at any time in history when human beings live, they always thought that this is, this is it. This is normality. This is how people should live. This is, this is it. Well, we're no different. We're wrong in that sense. Um, so, so there was no you know, modern type state. There were different populations, different power holders. You have the Mongol invasion as well, which will uh, you know, take over here. Uh, let's go to 700 because that takes us closer to um, uh, to where we want to get 1800. And now we see this, you know, you see these red patches. And what these red patches are, they are actually the advent of the well expansion of the uh, British colonial power, and who will obviously take over the entire Indian subcontinent, and will then because of taking over will. Um, and creating the Indian Raj, right? Initially, it was a, a British commercial enterprise that had the rights to governance there. But then um, it became part of the British Empire politically, right? At first, it was a business, basically, that, that ran the Indian subcontinent. And then <clears throat> um, uh, it became an actual administrative part of the British Empire, and it was called uh, the British Raj, or the British sort of, uh, you know, kingdom or something like that. Uh, British run Indian kingdom. But here's the point. Because the Brits, the Brits will create this Raj that will cover most of the Indian subcontinent, while maintaining, by the way, and accepting the presence of hundreds and thousands of local powers, they, they worked in a very different ways, in different, just like the Roman Empire. Certain territories they controlled directly, certain territories of the uh, Indian subcontinent, because they didn't have the manpower, they controlled through um, proxies, basically, right? So you had the local... Uh, um, Maharaja, yeah, Maharaja, who, who uh, prince, who basically uh, became a subject of the British Empire, but he retained, retained his, uh, his authority in that, that small principality. And that's kind of, you know, be, because this is a hodgepodge of principalities and power holders and villages and, 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 and powers. Um, there has never been an India until the British will create the Raj, which will create this colonial entity, yeah, which in the struggle of uh, independence or of uh, breaking away from, from Britain in the 20th century will sort of take the existing Raj and, and create India with the help of, of Gandhi. Now, we're not dealing with India today, but it's important because Myanmar uh, becomes part of the British Raj. So as the, as the, as the um, um, British interests expand and the colonial uh, sort of empire expands, you see that it goes eastward as well. And it will... Um, there will be three wars with um, whatever powers were in, in that territory that today is Burma, uh, won by the British, and eventually the British, you see, they're expanded, expanding, and eventually they will take over uh, everything of what today is Burma, which is, all, which is important, right? And they also will create this independent province called Burma, um, um, which will be part of the British Raj. And that's important because this is what happened in Africa as well. Many of the states that today exist in Africa, if, well, most of them, uh, one, one could say, are actually former colonies who, um, you know, colonies were arbitrary. The borders of colonies were arbitrary, right? It was basically how far the French could go before the British pushed back or the Dutch or the Belgians or whoever were there, right? So they are arbitrary, they have nothing to do, more or less, I mean, uh, more often than not, with the, the under, sort of an organic underlying reality. 
So, uh, you know, there's this area only populated by these people, ethnically, culturally, you know, similar, and then that becomes the colony. No, of course not, because there were no states in Africa as we knew, know them today, um, um, uh, these, you know, central authority, whatever, control over territory and membership. Um, you had, most of them were, you know, uh, 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 villages, tribes, and so on in terms of forms of organization. You had some states, but mostly in North Africa, whatever. Point being, these colonial borders were arbitrary. But the process of, of, of um, um, spreading this model of the modern state that happened in the 19th, 20th century, of, then overlapping with the process of decolonization, um, leads, will lead in the 19th, 20th century, uh, in Africa as much as in India, um, to uh, the people from a specific colony demanding, uh, or leaders from there, or some groups from there, demanding that they break away from the empire. But they happen to be in this arbitrary colonial border, which could have been completely different, and they, the people inside, are not a people. There are 10, 20, 50, 20, 100, 200 different groups. <laughs> but because they're in part of this colony, it was the members of the colony who wants to independence, but who is, who is us, yeah? Who is us who are part of this colony? Is there an us, yeah? Except for the fact that we are united arbitrarily by this colonial boundaries. So if you look at the, the, the current, um, um, you know, developments current last 50 years in Africa, you will see the amount of, of um, struggle that comes from this, this interesting situation. Just look at Nigeria, right? Um, where uh, you have a state that is a state because it used to be a colony yeah, or a colonial entity or colonially defined you know, boundaries. But inside there is no, uh, or there used to be no shared identity. Uh, and even if there is sort of now a, st a civic sort of belonging to one state, other identities, tribal, ethnic, are much more powerful than that. I said that about Africa because the same thing happened in India. Hence, we will have the emergence of India and Pakistan because Pakistan will simply be people from the India subcontinent. Because remember, there was no India before the British Raj as such. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you look at the history of India, you had all kinds of empires and then never really controlling the entire subcontinent and throughout having you know, thousands of different groups there. And the same will happen with, with Myanmar. Yeah, with Burma. That's, that's the important thing. That Burma will emerge because it was a province um, distinct from the Indian subcontinent, but part of the Indian uh, Raj. Uh, for example, the India unification effort, they never really cared much about the Burma because it was different. It was from a different... Well, uh, it, it's not part of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, um, culturally uh, significantly different. But... Um, uh, so if you look at the British Raj, right, so here's the British Raj, there you go, right, so you, you see Upper Burma, Lower Burma, right, there you go. So <clears throat> it will be this, um, this entity defined colonially, right, by, by the um, uh, colonial power that will um, demand independence, well, clearly the process will not be simple. And, and here we get to, to where we wanted to, to go, namely the emergence, the formation of the modern uh, uh, state of, of uh, Burma or Myanmar. Uh, and that happens again, of course, as, as at the same time as it happens, uh, you know, what we call India today and what, happened, what we call today uh, Pakistan, yeah? Um, because they all, all this Raj, you know, uh, sort of separates from, from the British Empire basically at the same time, 1947, thereabouts. <clears throat> and, um, but it results in different things, right? So first it will result on the Indian subcontinent into an India and a Pakistan. And again, Pakistan is simply the people from the Indian subcontinent who didn't want to become part of this unified India, because mostly because of they were Muslim. So here's where... Uh, is that an ethnicity? Well, it becomes a sort of an ethnocultural trait of identity, but how? Because, I mean, how are they different from the other people from the... Uh, remember, before the formation of Pakistan as a state, there were no Pakistani. 
Yeah, there simply were Muslims from the Indian subcontinent who, 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 um, um, who didn't want to be part of this new Indian project, and there was this huge exchange of population, millions of people moving from one place to the other overnight, basically. Uh, millions, um, a million people, I think, died in the process, because, of course, it was violent. And the same, from the same Raj, later we'll have what was, you know, what will be, um, so here, if you look at the... Um, and this, what if you look at you know, let's say 1950, you see um, you see um, so you see a, 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 a Western um, India. You see an Eastern Pakistan and a Western Pakistan, right? So here's the Western Pakistan and Eastern Pakistan, right? Weird, right? Because again, there's no the logic was simply, you know, we didn't want to become part of this India. Um, uh, you have a Burma. Well, it, this eastern Pakistan will become later Bangladesh. Right? There you go. Is this already? No, maybe it's 70-something. There you go. So, uh, Bangladesh. Yeah? So... That's the process, yeah? And this is why, uh, you know, I mean, it's important to understand uh, 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 this, this, this process because that, that and look at this border, these borders, as you see them here, they were never a state before the British Raj. So how do you form a state um, when this hasn't been a state before, Yeah. Uh, well, the process usually, uh, this is the process of nation building. And as I mentioned, this is one of the issues that which this, this uh, podcast will um, deal with. It's an issue that, that interests me. Uh, ethnicity, nationhood, nation building, state building. And here's the process of state building. So um, what happens in 1947, in, well, 1930s, 1940s, you have elites, yeah? Elites which um, were basically, you know, educated people, um, uh, civil servants, um, teachers, newspaper men, lawyers um, in this area, uh, who will start defining um, and working towards, um, first of all, a national plan uh, and proposing a common national plan, which will be a common national identity. So you have, you have to create, when nation building is a process of creating a narrative, I'm not saying inventing necessarily, because you're, you're building on things that are there, but some of them you add, or you connect them in a certain way, because your goal is to, 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 to convince everyone that there is such a thing as a nation, yeah, and because there is such a thing as a nation, then that nation also deserves to have a state. Because that's the process of nation and state building in modernity. And, and funnily enough, it has to do with democracy. This idea that the people should govern themselves. Well, if the people should govern themselves, the next question is to ask, which people? Who are the people? Because if you say people, humankind, it means that we have, need to have one government for the entire humankind, because that's the people. So you need to, to create smaller entities. Well, where do you draw the borders? Because again, let's understand clearly, you know, it, visit this, this uh, website, uh, it's going to be linked in the blog, where you can go to the history of the world, and you see that the way the world looks today, well, it has never looked like that ever in history. Yeah? Uh, neatly divided in states. Never. Yeah? Because that's not how people lived. The most natural way of living, organically developing, yeah, it's, it's, uh, are smaller entities. Villages, regions, yeah? Because how far can you go before you lose track of, of who you are, yeah? Cultures develop mostly regionally in the sense of, you know, you go to... I mean, so this is why Switzerland is a confederal state, because uh, made of, of different um, uh, um, cantons, each of them historically de developed in a, basically a valley, a uh, geographic region. Because each of those valleys, with those high peaks, developed their own culture, own language, yeah? They spoke different, speak and spoke different languages. Because that's the natural way. So, so the advent of the modern state is, is, is a recent phenomenon uh, made possible by modern technology 
and transportation, which allows us a center of power to expand and impose its authority over, in, over a larger territory and to maintain it there. As we'll see in Burma, it's not really the case. So, uh, so we, t we get to nation and state building around 1947, and guess who is an important actor in Burma uh, of, of this process of nation and state building? It is um, the father of this um, current hero of democratic opposition in Burma, uh, this lady, Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, it was her father, uh, Aung San. Um, and again, m for most of these things, you, have, you will have links in the blog, as, as usually, if you want to read further. Um, so Aung San was, was, was the leader, um, um, kind of like, you know, remember Nehru in, uh, in, um, in India. Well, remember, if you know, Nehru in India. Um, and then his, uh, his, his descendants, who remain important um, uh, people in uh, Indian politics, uh, like Indira Gandhi, who, by the way, is not related to Gandhi, but to Nehru. Nehru being one of the heroes of, you know, heroes of um, Indian independence, fathers of the nation. But the same here. An San, uh, one of the fathers of the nation. And, um, again, look at where Burma is situated. So how do you create, how do you obtain independence? You're not part, you don't want to be part of India. Um, there are radical differences between these populations here and the populations from the Indian subcontinent, as, diver as diverse as those are between themselves. Uh, but by the way, during the, of course, when you had the Indian, uh, with the British Raj, um, the, there was a mass um, in, influx of in, well, people from the Indian continent, subcontinent, let's call them Indians, as much as that is a stretch. And uh, one of the reasons was that, well, first of all, it we were part of the same entity, the British Raj, and also the British usually mostly employed Indians as civil servants, not people from Burma, members of the ethnic groups from Burma. That's important, though, because so you have this influx of Indian, you also have influx of Chinese, because there's China. That's be between, uh, besides the, all the ethnic groups that have lived there for centuries. Yeah, you have a more recent influxes of Chinese and Indians. And this is important to, to remember. And Indians who were sort of privileged in the, when the, during the British Raj. So anyway, so you look at where Burma is. So Aung San, what, she, what he would do is, uh, um, you know, he was a nationalist leader. Um, so a nationalist leader wants to, who is the opponent? At that point, during the time of the British Raj, the opponent was, of course, um, um, was of course um, the the, Brit the Brits, yeah, the British, <laughs> the British were the uh, uh, were the opponents, and um, uh, so Aung San uh, will want to um, fight the British, and uh, the way he would do that will be uh, by um, allying themselves with whoever was the enemy. Well, who is the enemy of the British in the late thirties, early forties in that region that you just saw? Well, it, World War II is coming up, yeah, Japan. So, uh, Aung San was initially actually um, a member of the nationalist wing of the Burmese Communist Party, yeah? And then gets trained in Japan and forms a, a, an army. So that's very important because is, forming institutions is a key to creating uh, statehood, yeah? Uh, because you need to coalesce the efforts of many in order to, to act towards defining nationhood and to, to claim statehood. Uh, you have in India, you'll have the Indian National Congress that will form, that will lead to formation of India. Um, here in Burma, it will be the, uh, uh, the Burma Independence Army. And that's important because the army will be the sort of the entity that will be the uh, mechanism uh, creating a Burma army. Now notice the, in itself the concept, yeah? It assumes that there is a Burma. It assumes that there is a common identity, and and it assumes that uh, we get together, we get be, you know uh, together to fight for uh, common independence. Yeah, so a common institution, common independence, common identity, all in one um, name, all in one institution. And he created this Burma Independence Army. Now keep this in mind. This, this is a key role then that the army plays. The army played in the very establishment of the state called Burma. 
So, so, so he allies this Burma Independence Army with the Japanese and fights the British in World War II. So in World War II, the Burma Independence Army was an ally of the Japanese in order to fight the British, in order to obtain independence. That was his ultimate goal, not that he was you know, enamored with the Japanese. I assume he wasn't. But then, of course, the Japanese lose the war, and as the <laughs> war progresses, and I guess um, towards the end of the war, again, then it becomes... From his perspective and the perspective of these these elites who were fighting for who were advocating statehood for a Burma, yeah, from their perspective, well, being allies with Japanese would be the stupidest thing to do, yeah, because that means that you're a loser at the end of the war and you're gonna lose what you were fighting for, uh, this striving for independence. So what he will do, he's actually gonna switch and join the British against the Japanese. So there you go. Um, so in 45, he, the Burma Independence Army, Anang San, ch- ch- joined the British against the Japanese, which is a smart move because they become then the winners of the conflict, you know, part of the winner group, more or less. And in uh, <coughs> 1947, there is this famous Pang Long conference where Aung San, and there are other leaders, of course, just like in India, you have Nehru and Gandhi and others. Here, Aung San, there were many leaders besides Aung San, several leaders. Third, about 30 of them, I think they were called the group of 30 or something like that. But anyway, um, some of them will become important later. So Aung San and the other elites bring together uh, representatives um, of most uh, of the most populous ethnic groups. There you go, right? Because <laughs> you want to create an elite um, to get them behind the project of statehood. But do they want to be part of this new statehood? Well, guess what? Some will not want to become part of this statehood. Because, you know, why would we be part of this Burma where the Bamar ethnic group is, has, a, has a good proportion? So what is our future there? You know, just like in India and Pakistan and so on. Uh, so, for example, the, 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 uh, the members of the Karen or the delegates of the Karen ethnic group uh, will, will kind of withdraw from the conference. Um, and this is, you know, just one instance of something that is still going on, which is basically the fact that a good number of these ethnic groups, uh, well, they don't want to be part of Burma, or maybe they, they're, um, well, let me put it this way, they don't feel uh, safe or protected, or um, uh, that they have an assured future or present in Burma as it is today. And that's, that's, the, that's the important thing, that, for example, you know, the, the, the switch from junta, the uh, authoritarian regime, to, to democracy, which happened after 2010, 2012. So in the last eight years, when you had sort of democratization in Burma or Myanmar, you actually had an intensification of ethnic conflict. We're going to get there, but just to give you a sense that this is not something that was invented. It seems, and this is one of the themes, right, that I'm suggesting here, that this process of nation building never, uh, never ended, or never really happened, or it's still ongoing. I think that's the best way to put it. And of state building, by the way, which is not the same thing. Okay, uh, so the alliance led by um, Aung Sun, Aung San, um, uh, he forms this broad alliance with uh, representatives of different ethnic groups and uh, whatever political groups, and it, which was called. <coughs> The Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League. Anti-Fascist probably because, you know, to, to, to point out that they're against the Japanese. <coughs> or, or were. They win the first election in 1947. And that seems, okay, future is bright. Well, again, not only are there and were there ethnic divisions, there were also severe political divisions because think again where Burma is. <clears throat> and what was happening after World War II, which was the beginning of the Cold War. So you have China, you have uh, Soviet Union. So you also have the communist influence. So you have these all kinds of political paramilitary groups, including communist groups, that fight the, this new Burma, fight the new regime. Aung, Aung San uh, is assassinated in forty-seven. But before forty-eight and 62, you will have a sort of a function, well, more or less functioning, uh, republic. Um, with many problems, but you know, and 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 this continued presence of communist or so ideological, political, and also ethnic separatist groups. Because as I said, okay, we created Burma, but not everybody wants to be part of this Burma 
why would they? Um, and, um, and, and actually, in, during this period of 48 to 62, uh, the, the person who was the prime minister during this period, Unu, uh, Unu who was the prime minister, um, he, he would also uh, do things that are, were not very conducive to um, the, 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 this furthering or the creation or advancement of this um, of, a, of, a, of a common national identity and uh, statehood. Um, for example, he will, um, this prime minister will uh, make Buddhism the official state religion. Now, with ethnic diversity, you could assume and think again, where is Burma, that there is also a great um, uh, degree of religious diversity, indeed. There is a, a majority of, um, you know, Buddhists, yeah? But there are Christians, there's Muslims, there's animists, there's Hindu, there's whatever you want. Uh, and also in this period, uh, in the post-war period, they, they, um, uh, the new regimes, yeah, the new Burma regimes, start also pushing back, in fact, will force uh, hundreds of thousands of Indians to leave the country. Because, you know, they were newcomers, newcomers for, you know, 100 years, but also because they dominated the local economy and so on. So there's this, so part of the process of nation building, which complicates it, is also the fact that besides the, the diversity of ethnic groups who have been there for centuries and centuries, you also have um, uh, these newcomers themselves, you know, probably arriving into the area gradually and across, you know, along the decades, but still in the last century or so. So much so that, again, when you claim, okay, we're a Burma, you're going to have to ask, who is, which, which Burma? Who is, who is Burma? Like the Indians, are they Burma? Then why aren't we part of India? Because um, there is no a Burma. And you can't say it's the, the land of the Bamar, because Bamar is just one of the ethnic groups there. So what is a Burma? That's, that's, that's a challenge here. Um, so interestingly enough, besides trying to define a Burma identity, or part of defining the Burma identity is by defining it as the state of these uh, indigenous, they call them, well, the words in, in Burmese are not the same as we use them. So for them, when you, they say ethnicity, race, the words sound very much like race. So they refer to them as indigenous races, not necessarily ethnic groups. Now, it's important because race has this sense of immutability, right? It's something that cannot be changed and so on. Although race in itself is also an invention or a construct. Um, but, but they refer to indigenous races. So when there is the process of, of uh, independence, uh, fighting for independence, they will um, uh, define as constitutive sort of ethnicities, indigenous races, the ones who formed Burma, those who used to be there before the British came in. Now, if you say before the British came in 1825, I think it was, it means that you exclude the Indians who came in, yeah, um, in during the British Raj. Maybe you exclude some of the Chinese. External relations of Burma in the 60s, 70s also play a role because sometimes they had it better with the India, sometimes with the China, and the role of the sort of the ethnic groups, Chinese and Indian there, will sort of fluctuate according to external relations as well. But Indians will have it kind of badly, also because they were, as I said, the dominant class economically. And for example, oh, so, so we're going to get there in a second. So, so but you notice how, well, it's never simple. But how complicated it is, this, uh, this, this process of, of, of nation building and, and state building. Well, think of just, you know, United States and what happened with the native indigenous populations here, that they, they get to, now they have reservations which are quasi-sovereign and they call nations. It's the same thing. It's this awkward thing. How can they be sovereign within the United States? Uh, what do you mean they're nations? Because they're clearly not nations. That It's a modern concept. They're tribes. And so you see that this is not uh, unique to Burma. Yeah, this is, happens everywhere and everyone has to deal with the, this idea that in modernity we think that a state needs to be democratic, which means it needs to be part, uh, belong to a people, but there is no such thing as state and people, yeah? <laughs> because that's not how human beings evol evolved. Yeah? Um, and so you kind of either force everyone inside the state to become a people, like the French model, 
uh, or push out, uh, or you define it ethnically and then you push out some of the people, ethnic cleansing, gen genocide, or you have a majority ethnic group and you have, you call them minority ethnic groups, but it's never, because all of these modern states in which this, this construct of the nation state, in which you have a, let's, let's clarify, a nation is a group of people, the, the definition being, who are united by some set of fundamental traits, whatever they might be. And the state is a set of institutions uh, that, that, that govern a territory and a membership. Yeah? So you can have a state, you, you don't necessarily have a nation, the two are not the same. Like the Roman Empire was a state, there was no Roman nation. Yeah, I mean, they they govern over many ethnic national, whatever you want to, it's improper, ethnic, tribal, whatever groups. Yeah, so the the modern idea though is that each nation is to have its state, as if this is why in the modern modernity is the process of building nations, of constructing nations, because you need to invent them in order to claim statehood. Uh, invent them usually by sort of leveling different groups into one thing. Look at German, look at Italy, where you force on everyone that who never used, was a nation to tell them, no, no, you're a nation, and shut up with your dialect, speak this dialect, and that's going to be Italian. But how about my dialect? Why not my dialect? Well, shut up. Same with Spain, right? You have the Basque, the Catalan, they speak completely different languages, not even dialects, different languages. Well, no, no, you're Spanish. Really? So, but, and, and uh, me saying this is not Okay, now advocating the opposite or they shouldn't be. Again, we are analyzing. We're trying to understand the process yeah, and understand the process and, and, and the complexity. And, you know, if you don't like that he'll, the world is complicated, tough. Um, but, but you can't ignore this because this is it. This is the world. And whether you ignore it or not, it's not going to, you know, it doesn't affect uh, its complexity. So back, back, to, back to Burma. So after this period of quasi-functioning, quasi-democracy, 48 to 62, not a happy, I mean, a lot of instability and so on, there, there is a coup um, by Newin, is the, who was one of the sort of original independence fathers of the new republic with An Ansan. Yeah? And Nevin um, endeavors a coup d'etat with the military. And 1962 until 2012-ish, you will have military rule in Burma. Yeah? Led by, so a regime led by a junta. Junta being the name of a regime when the regime is led uh, in a non-democratic way by a group of military um, leaders. But why the military? Well, if I ask you why the military, you probably will be able to tell me, or you would guess, that, well, think of what was the most important agent, mechanism in, the constitu in, in constituting the new the Republic of Burma. Yeah? I mean, the new state, the, the country. Uh, it was, right, the Burma Independence Army. Yeah? In India, it was a party. In Burma, it was the army. So the army, in a way, is... Um, if DNA is embedded with the DNA of this, this project of Burma, yeah, of a state. And by the way, you know, I'm asking, you know, I started sort of, you know, in a sort of a cheeky question, is what is a Burma, is there a Burma? Yeah, I'm not saying this in order to con contest the, the existence of Burma, that's stupid. Or, or to say, well, maybe there shouldn't be a Burma, or maybe there shouldn't be, or maybe there should be. It's obvious in order to inquire into the, the nature of the state and the nature of the, of the situation. It's not to make a point. Uh, um, uh, but again, following in this, in, this, in this idea that you can ask the same thing from what is a Germany, should there be a Germany, and so on. So it's, not, uh, you know, because no, all of these social, social political realities, uh, as I said, they're human products, they're constructs, they... Um, do not have to exist, and they do not have to be the, in the exact form that they are today, as we know them today. And they won't be, by the way, in you know, 5,000 years from now. <laughs> I can guarantee it. Um, so 1962, um, there's this coup, and what's in, uh, uh, how interesting is um, that, the, um, that the regime that will be formed uh, as a result of this, of this coup will be both a 
a, a military um, dictatorship, like uh, you know, led by a junta, as I said, will be also socialist, but not communist, and against the communist guerrillas, and in fact it will break with um, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and maybe also with China. So, socialist and autarkic. Uh, autar autarky is this model, or, well, it is a model of uh, a state uh, running the state and, and the economy, which basically <coughs> tries to um, um, to only uh, subsist uh, and to maintain itself based only on its own resources, internal resources. So, through exclusion of the of the rest of the world and cutting relationships with the rest of the world, and famously, this is what Burma became, right? This isolated state, uh, autarkic. This has been tried in, in, in Africa as well. It's always a temptation. <coughs> Self-reliance, complete self-reliance, cutting all sort of um, economic dependence or relationship with the external. It always fails. Yeah. So unsurprisingly, Burma will become one of the poorest countries and less developed in the world in the, in the decades of the, of the junta. Um, which will obviously really, uh, uh, um, lead to protests and so on. And another thing I wanted to mention, so military, socialist, autarky, and also combining some Buddhism and local traditions in sort of their own Burmese way, sort of Burmese socialism sort of a thing. Um, autarkic socialism uh, sort of a way. Um, and by the way, socialism and nationalism are not contradictory in terms. IRA in uh, Northern Ireland is also, uh, the, the, the nationalist movement there was, was dominated by socialist, uh, IRA is socialist, which is not the same as communist. Yeah, let's be clear. So uh, things that happened during these junta years, well, first of all, economic failure, um, but nationalization, right? So they nationalized, and part of the reason why they nationalized the businesses and so on at the beginning was um, part of the socialist way as well, which was also being tried in neighboring India during the initial part, time of Nehru. Um, and the reason was, um, well, part of the reason was in order to disenfranchise the Indians from Burma. Some of them who will be pushed out uh, in those decades, but because they dominated about 60% of the commerce uh, was dominated and traded by Indians, in Burma, nationalization was a way of taking these, uh, this economic power from them. There was also a, a, a sort of a pro bamar pro sort of dominant ethnic group policies, which will not help. Uh, there was also so many rebel groups, military groups, guerrilla, including communist rebels, so continued fighting. And this is a, this is a trend. Because you would say, okay, you have a junta, you have a military-run uh, regime, so you have a strong state. Meaning, what does it mean a strong state? Well, if a state, and I'm going to give you the, the definition I usually use to define a state, a state is a set of institutions with um, a sovereign power over a territory and a membership. Uh, and who are the members of a state? Well, whoever the state decides they are members, and that term for membership in a state is citizenship, which has nothing to do with ethnicity or nationhood or whatever. It's who the state decides its, its members, is its members. So sovereign power over a territory and membership. Sovereign power means uh, exclusive power and means effective power. Yeah? We usually ta uh, talk about failed states uh, like Somalia is when there is a, a, a formally only a state but actually cannot um, exercise effective control over the territory. There are parts of Colombia that used to be, maybe still are, uh, run by guerrilla groups. That's in those parts, there's a failed state. So, same in Mexico with, with um, uh, narco uh, you know, gangs and, and parts where the state has failed. Well, Burma has never had the Burmese state, yeah? So the process of nation building is one thing. When you try to create this common narrative of there is a common population that share something, many would disagree. Um, uh, and who desire their own state, that's nation building. State building is different. State building is to create these institutions through which you exercise um, effective control over a territory and over the entirety of the territory and over all the members. Now, this has never really happened completely in Burma, not to today. 
So today you have wide swaths, especially towards the borders of Burma, also keep in mind the terrain there, for a deeply forested, less populated, whatever, where the state has no, the, centrist, the central power of the state, has no authority. Uh, they, they're dominated by rebel uh, militias, ethnic militias, or the state projects its authority by sort of contracting out with local militias, which is, again, kind of like the Roman Empire or kind of like the British Raj. Uh, so even today, you have these tribal or village militias and the, the, the mighty Burmese army, which is actually very large and very strong, 400,000, uh, 400,000? Maybe 400,000 large. Uh, it's, it's, it's significant. By the way, Burma has a population of about 50 to 57 million, depends on who you ask. So let's say 51 to 57. I, I saw different numbers. So it's a large, it's a large uh, country. Um, so so uh, a, a large Burmese army, but it has no authority in many parts of the Burma, and some places it sort of hires local militias to exercise its, uh, the authority of the state. So the state building never happened. I mean, never happened. It's still going on. So that kind of gives you a sense of the challenges facing Burma and some of the responses given by the politicians and by the military and why the military wanted to, to do a coup. Um, well, I'm not saying, I'm not explaining why, but you see its role from the beginning in, in the process of, of um, state building and, 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 for example, the current military leader, um, uh, you know, people say that he has this... Um, quite um, uh, exaggerated view of his role in, in Burmese history. Well, you know, maybe his role is defined being the, the leader of the army, sort of in conjunction with the idea of the role of the Burmese army. Remember, it was the mechanism that led to the formation of Burma. Okay, um, so um, anyway, the years of the junta, obviously they don't go well economically, so you have uprisings, you have uh, protests. Uh, major uprising in 85, the key uprising that sort of becomes emblematic, sort of like, let's say, 1956 in Hungary, uh, anti-Soviet uh, uh, uprising, or, or the Solidarność in, um, in, in Poland in the 80s, is 1988. Is those, uh, that uprising in 1988, which, which uh, entailed wide swaths of the population, students, workers, and Buddhist monks. Now remember, Buddhist monks is a socio-economic group, yeah, which you can enter, you can also leave. Uh, they're not the same as, you know, Christian monks. It's not the same role. So let's, you know, we're misusing certain words, but let's not project the content from one concept onto the other indiscriminately. Uh, they're more like a socio-economic group. Um, with, um, and it's something that the, the regime managed to alienate the, the, the Buddhist um, sort of... Um, uh, these Buddhist forces, yeah, because they are important in the society that is, has a, a majority uh, of, of, of Buddhist uh, practi practicing Buddhism. Um, <clears throat> so, so you have this uprising that is crushed viciously, uh, violently uh, by the regime. Thousands of people die, and this is the moment when Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of Aung San. Um, uh, returns to home. She doesn't return for the for the uprising. She, uh, nobody knew it was going to happen, as it goes with these things. Uh, she returns to take care of her mother, um, who, by the way, her mother also used to be a politician. Uh, you know, her father, Ansan, father of the nation. Her mother also became a politician, worked at the UN. Ansan, the daughter, studies abroad, marries an Englishman returns in 88 because her mother is home and is ill to take care of her mother. Uprising happens and Aung San, who is 40-something at the time, um, had worked in the UN, whatever, has studies, suddenly is catapulted to the forefront uh, of uh, Burmese politics, at that point called Burma, and she gives a, a famous speech in... Um, uh, well, 88, uh, to a large uh, mass of, of in front of the Buddhist temple. She is Buddhist. That's important. 
in front of half a million people. Half a million people. A famous speech combining um, both in her speech and also in her ethos later uh, Buddhism and this idea of democratization, so anti-junta, and I would assume also nationalism in the idea of the nation building and of her being the daughter of, of her father. Yeah, um, The idea of a Burma, one, one would assume, is central to her, to her thought. The idea of there is a Burma. And remember, this is in the conditions in which nation building, I would argue, has not been concluded, completed. Now anyway, she becomes this hugely popular figure for the Burmese. Burmese. Um, and um, as a response, as a, as a result, the regime uh, sends her to house arrest um, f- in several rounds. Yeah. So the, the, the revolt is crushed in 88, but you know, I uh, likened this 88 uprising, and um, by the way, one of the key moments there was the general strike on 8888. So it's this 4 8 that remains emblematic. Um, uh, the general strike. So this whole uh, series of events and the, 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 the violent response of the regime uh, doesn't go by without a trace. Now, you know, the junta, right, they, I'm sure they're rich. They were rich. They had all the benefits. They were elites. But there's also a mission dimension there. The mission is Burma, and the mission is sort of serving the people. Any regime pretends to do that and has to do that to a degree in order for it not to crumble. Yeah? And it has to promote a certain ideology, at least in the propaganda, of serving the people. Um, so such events like this crushing of a mass uprising in, in blood does it, can't just pass by unnoticed and the regime to remain as it was. So Ned Wynne, who was the, the leader then, has to resign no matter that the revolution was crushed. Some other military leader takes his, 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 um, his, um, his place. And um, they also uh, later will change the name sort of, the, you know, this junta always changed sort of uh, the name to sound good. Yeah. Prosperity, progress, something they call themselves alliance for, um, and also try to do some reforms, including pro- uh, promote, proposing some elections in 1990, which elections will take place, but the junta will refuse to accept the results of the election, because in those elections, uh, the NLD, and what is the, um, uh, the NLD? It is this democrat- democratizing uh, National League for Democracy, I think is the, the full name, is this, um, basically, the, it is the, 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 the institution uh, born, opposition institution born in those days of 1988, Aung San Suu Kyi being one of the leaders from the beginning. Yeah, so 1988, Aung San Suu Kyi projected suddenly she is one of the major leaders, and there's also now an institutional mechanism to promote opposition forces to, to stand for what the opposition is, sort of opposing the regime, NLD. So NLD, uh, um, if I remember correctly, yeah, NLD would win 80% in the 1990s election, so the junta refuses to acknowledge them. Yeah, well, what just happened in the last month? Um, okay, so Aung San Suu Kyi will, uh, will uh, be in and out of house arrest over the next decades, in total about 15 years of house arrest intermittently, and, and the regime will um, also fluctuate, because again, it, economically it was disastrous, and, and you can't s- remain, can't sustain yourself if you don't provide something for the people. So the regime is also hit by sanctions, especially the um, Cold War is not over, so they can't really play some of those games with playing one um, um, country against the other, like themselves with the Soviets or whatever. I'm not saying they did, but they can't do that, that game. In the 90s, it seems like we have uh, one global power, the U.S. U.S. imposes, uh, under Clinton, harsh sanctions on Burma. So that destabilizes even further the economy. So Burma, um, so the, the junta decides again. So it fluctuates between loosening strength, uh, uh, and, and narrowing the, 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 the noose sort of around the, the, the country. Um, so, so you have her being released and then put, put back in house arrest. 
In 2003, there is an attack on her and her entourage in which, well, there was a huge delegation. They were going, I don't know, maybe there was a party congress, I don't know. Uh, so other people from NLD with Aung San Suu Kyi, <coughs> and uh, 70 of them are massacred. She's spared because she's Aung San Suu Kyi, because she is the daughter of Aung San. But it just tells you of, of the harshness of the repression. In fact, and then, you know, the, 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 the prime minister in the 2000s, situation it gets even worse. Uh, so things like uh, labor camps to some ethnic minorities, forced labor, um, parts of uh, Burma being run by warlords and gangs and, and narco gangs, drug lords. Um, in fact, Myanmar becomes the second uh, largest producer of opium after Afghanistan in the, in the 2000s. Disaster. And of course, the response for, 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 for uh, you know, it's either uh, to have this opposition group, NLD, or each of the ethnic groups sort of protecting themselves by creating militias. Because if you don't protect yourself, there's no one to, to protect you. Protect yourself both from the regime and from other ethnic groups. Because that's the other pattern we need to understand. It's not like, again, oh, there's this bad, bad junta, and then there's the good everybody else. There's some, there's some uh, videos, <coughs> documentary style and um, on YouTube presenting from the 2000s uh, documenting very interesting ones maybe I'll link a couple of them uh, how uh, some of the militias fighting the junta but some of them are so naively um, sort of framed uh, they're saying oh the whatever ethnic group militia or guerrilla force fighting the bad junta well, yeah, but they also fought each other, and everybody used child soldiers, and 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 these guerrilla groups uh, allied themselves with other guerrilla groups of, and fought the other ethnic group, because it is a, 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 an area of competing ethno nationalisms. Why? Because if you don't have your own guerrilla force, your own armed group, then you're at the mercy of the other group, yeah, of the other ethnic group who has. He doesn't love you. Yeah, and he's gonna they're gonna take your resources. That's the situation. Again, I was talking about unfinished nation building, if there is such a thing as finished. Okay, um but so things get worse and worse. Um then in 2008 again, pendulum, a new constitution is passed, again an attempt by the junta to do something to, to solve the, the, this untenable situation. Like, where are we going, right? Because you can, you know, live in catastrophe, but for how long? So they, they, they write this constitution to assure a sort of a transition, because if you look at the propaganda or the narrative of the junta, is, is always, I think that the name that they took up in 1987-ish, if I can find it, yeah, um, that, that was in the early 90s, the State Law and Order Restoration Council, this was after 1988, but there was a, an even better name later on. I'm not sure I'm going to find it. But it's all these, you know, uh, prosperity and progress sort of a thing. Because there needs to be a, a, a narrative and, you know, otherwise, why are we doing what we're doing? What are we telling the people? We need to govern this, this, this place. Um... And again, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a sense of mission for, for, the, um, for the military. Linked with this, the role of the military in, in, in uh, you know, originally in nation building, state building, in the independence. So this constitution uh, passed in 2008, uh, will be linked in the blog, um, tries to sort of, what is a constitution? Yeah, a constitution is a, a, a sort of a um, most fundamental law, yeah? It is a law, uh, a body of law, yeah? Uh, that sets the framework of a state and of a political system and of, uh, of the nation associated with that state. Now, you notice that none of these realities, state, nation, uh, are, you know, are con uh, fine, um, um, completed, let me put it this way, or, 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 or let, me, let, me, let me rephrase it, uh, all of these are 
even in 2008, uh, are part of an ongoing process. You can't say that there is a that the state building has finished because there's large swaths that are not controlled by the state. Nation building even less. Yeah, there's not one nation. And we want to transition from a sort of authoritarian regime and socialist to market economy and democratic. So in the constitution, you will, which sets up the institutions of the new political system, you will see traces of all of this. And that's what's fascinating about it. So I'm going to link it. Um, and um, so let's look at, at the new system that is put together. I'm going to point out these strange institutional features that um, uh, you know, show how complicated the situation is and how these institutions reflect both the goal and, and, and uh, you know, so that we want to create a normal state, um, but also um, the peculiarity of the specific uh, context. So, um, so what kind of a system do they, do they set up? Well, first of all, um, here's the thing. You start by defining a state. Well, they basically say the borders that are, are. That's kind of, you know, since independence. Why these? Because the British Raj, but they're not going to say that. Um, then uh, they're going to say, who is us? Yeah, and they're going to have to design the citizenry, the members of the state, yeah? In this idea of nation state, yeah, which is again, as I said, a, a construct. So, <laughs> how are you defining who is us? And as I said, they will take over, will continue to take over that definition that you know was in, you know used in the first moments of the Republic, forties, uh, of whoever was here in before eighteen twenty five is us. So no Indians, no Chinese. But they're here, what do we do with them? Good, that's one question. Uh, so they will take that over, but also, like, how do we know who was really here and who wasn't here? And this will become, a, a, you know, there's, plus, remember, there is no census. We don't actually know who is here. We have that thing that the British did, the 135 groups, which was non-scientific, in fact. So what they do in order to, de to define the borders, okay, the borders are the ones that are, and it's very important, right? When you do state and nation building, you cling to borders because, you know, you always cling to things that are more, most vulnerable, that you feel less safe about. Um, then who, are, who is us? So they need to define a citizenry. And that's, that's again, it's, it's fascinating that, in fact, they will create three degrees of citizenry, which is, uh, you know, it's very rare and, and weird. Uh, well, um, but it shows you how complicated the situation is. So there is full citizenship, which is un, un, unsurprisingly use sanguini, sanguinis. The two major ways of assigning citizenship is based on parentage or based on where you're born. Based on parentage is use sanguine, law of the blood. So if your parents are citizens, you're, you are a citizen, even if you were born outside of the country. That's use sanguine. Um, and use soli is uh, the law of the land, of the, of the soil, of the, of the yeah. Um, is, is, is if you're born on the territory, you're a citizen. Uh, but if you're born outside of the territory, even if you're born from citizens, you're not a citizen. Well, these are two big models used around the world or combinations thereof. Now, unsurprisingly, this will be used sanguine because of this stress on defining who is us and who is not us. So only use sanguine can have full citizenship. Well, how about if you move to Burma and live there for three generations and, and your great-grandchild, can they become Burmese? So they have other degrees of citizenship. <coughs> there is... Um, I'm trying to 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 make sure that I that I make um, that I find the right terms, and I will find them either now or later. But there is full citizenship. Um, there is um, associated citizenship, and some sort of partial citizenship. Anyway, I'll find the, the exact names. But the point is, <laughs> there are three degrees um, of citizenry. With different rights, and this is again a very important thing. There you go. Um, 
with, with different um, citizen, citizen, full citizenship, uh, citizenship, which is only youth sanguine. There is associate citizen and there's naturalized citizen. And that's very important because citizenry, again, part of the, the modern narrative of the nation state and democracy, is the idea that a state is the state of a nation, which means that all the members of the nation are also members of the state, which, means that, um, which also means that all these members are, are in an equal legal position versus the state, yeah? as the equality under the law. That's citizenry. The citizenry is this weird thing in which if you're in, you're completely legally equal with every other person who is in the club, but if you're out, you're completely unequal yeah? with the, those who are members. It's this exclusive club sort of a thing, the club being the state. So, um, so in Burma, you have three types because there's the ones who were here before 1825, yeah? Then the ones who came later and have been here for about a century or more, they should be something if we didn't kick them out in between and they are um, maybe associated citizens, not full citizens. And then they're natural citizens who I, I would guess it's, it's if you live there for a while and, and whatever. But again, not full citizens, so you're not gonna have the same rights, which is very interesting. But again, it shows you that the processes I mentioned, nation and state building are not concluded for sure. Uh, and then, uh, so that's the second thing, uh, that's another thing about this constitution. Okay, so let's look at the political system. Now, what kind of political system um, does it implement this, this constitution? On paper, it looks like a quasi-semi-presidential political system, kind of like what France has. Which means that there are, uh, according to this new constitution 2008, which um, came into force in 2011, but the first full elections for it were in 2015. This is a, these are key moments because this is the moment, the, the start of the democratization process. With the junta, junta sort of led the process of writing the, 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 the constitution, so they would have an important role in writing it. And the whole process would be, you know, sort of a, mediated by foreigners as well, uh, but, you know, in dialogue with NLD and Aung Sun Suu Kyi. So the constitution and what will happen in the democratization process will be a, a result of compromises, right? Between the democratic anti-regime anti for anti-junta forces and, and the junta. So anyway, on paper, right? Because you want to create a normal political system and state. This looks like a same presidential system. Two, uh, two legislatures, an upper house and a lower house. Now, and here's the thing. Why do you have two legislatures? Well, it's a large country, many millions. Okay. But what does the upper and what does the lower house represent? Whom? Because normally when you have a bicameral system, the two chambers need to represent, yeah, to embody dif different entities, right? So, for example, in a federal state like the United States, the lower house, the House of Representatives, represent the people, and the upper house uh, represents the states, who are the constitutive elements of the United States. Now, here's the thing. Is Burma, this new constitution, does it create a federal Burma? Now, you would, I would, propose, suggest that, well, it should. Because it looks like a federal thing. And it almost looks like it. Because um, if you look at the map of the Burma uh, created, well, defined by this new constitution, based on what was there already, um, so let's look at this. Um, here's it. Here it is. What you'll see is that it ha seems to have several major entities, this Burma, right? You look at these differently colored uh, thing. Indeed, Burma is uh, the state of Burma, which is actually called, the official name, again important, the Republic, uh, Respublica, so it's a representative democracy, the Republic of the Union of Burma, which means that it's a union of things. Well, what things? It's not called the Federal Republic of Burma, it's called the Republic of the Union of Burma, so they're a union, so it's, they're united, but they're different things. So what things? Well, the major administrative entities that form Burma, or in which Burma is divided, are seven states and seven regions, which are the same thing in terms of, administratively speaking, in terms of their powers, 
but they're called differently, just like in um, the federal, uh, uh, the Russian Federal Republic has uh, the constitutive entities have different names. Some are republics, some are oblasts, some are okrug, some are uh, districts. And the reason why they're called differently is because the states that some the seven states that are part of Burma are basically ethnically based, but not in the sense of that there's all the, those guys of one ethnicity are in one state, because you saw the ethnic map, and let's just take a look. You can't draw that map. There is no such map in which, because that's how, not, not how people live. That, you know, draw this nice little thing. It's all people in this little thing. They're all the same. It doesn't work that way. But anyway, uh, at least they have a majority of, of different um, ethnic groups in, in each of these states, or at least the project being that. So, um, so the, uh, the Rakhine state, I think this is, no, this is the Rakhine state. I think this is, this is it. Um, uh, yeah, there's a second map here. There you go. Rakhine state or Arakan state. It's mostly the Rakhine people, but not only. Um, so here's um, so seven states, seven regions. The states being mostly ethnically defined, but again, you can't. It doesn't mean that everybody there is one ethnicity. In fact, they're not going to be, which creates other problems. And the regions being mostly Bamar, yeah, um, meaning populated by the majority, well, majority plurality ethnic group, Bamar Burmese. Um, so, so it's basically where the Bamar people live, divided into different administrative structures. And in addition, you also have some self-administrating territories, which are smaller, <coughs> sort of punctual parts. Again, just like in the uh, uh, Russian um, Federation, maybe they took that model, um, uh, which are smaller ethnic groups that are given self-administration. Not all of them, but some. So you have all these entities. So you have these entities and immediately you would think, I would think, that this must be a federal state. And what does it mean federal? Well, there are different ways of organizing a state. There's the unitary state and there's the federal state. And then there's, well, let's just go with these two. There's also confederal, but that's different. So the federal state, the essence of the federal state is that the central government has a set of powers and the, then the states that constitute um, that the, the the regions that constitute that that country, yeah, have separate sets of powers independent of the central power. So take the United States; that's truly a federal state. Um, uh, the state governments in the United States, so the regional governments, have exclusive powers over, let's say, education, health, uh, economy within that state. The federal government cannot tell them what to do. This is what it means federal, that you have entities that govern themselves in certain areas of life exclusively. Yeah? That's the United States. In fact, the federal government has very few powers constitutionally and very few areas of your life that are governed by the federal government. So you would expect this to be like that because it sort of lends itself naturally um, but guess what? Uh, it is not. Um, it is not um, the the um, state that is created by the um, by this new constitution uh, is actually uh, well. How should we characterize it? It looks a bit federal because of all these entities that it's created, but it's actually a centralized state. So let's say uh, it is a unitary state which has uh, the, the, the germs of federalism, or it is a very weak federal state, that it, or it's a very weak federal state that is highly centralized. I don't know how to put it, right? So we're trying to, 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 to juggle terms here. Uh, the point being that if you look at the, the, the and I'm going to link the constitution in the, in the blog, if you look at uh, the, these, the division of powers between the center and the, the regions are listed at the end of the constitution, you will notice that um, um, 
the, the powers reserved for the regions are very, very um, irrelevant. You know what it, re it reminds me of? Um, mostly um, the, the <coughs> devolution process in, in, uh, in the UK, where you have these, these um, uh, regional assemblies, national assemblies in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and uh, Wales, that each of them has specific things given to them that they can now run on their own, and they're all different. And I think that the most, um, in terms of the, what powers these regions got in Burma, they mostly reserved the, those puny powers uh, received by the Assembly in Wales. So the Assembly in Wales, what they can govern on their own, kind of that's what it resembles. So it's very, very, but sort of the, 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 the federal dimension is sort of there, somewhere. But you understand why they wouldn't go federal, right? Because the you can go federal, how should we put it? When you're confident enough. But at this point, central, at this point, never did the central government in Burma yeah, have full effective power over the entire territory. Never. So it's hard to move from that to federal uh, when you're afraid of, of losing those territories to, to start with. Well, anyway, so again, interesting, good. So then I said that it's like a semi-presidential system. So there's two assemblies, and I said uh, two, uh, two legislatures, upper house, lower house. <coughs> upper house, lower house. And now you're going to say, okay, so shouldn't these be elected differently? Some representing these ethnic states and regions and some. It doesn't really. And that's, so, uh, you know, a missed opportunity perhaps. Um, so anyway, both are elected. The members are elected through single member district, um, um, uh, single member districts. Uh, one of them in a two round election, and one of them in a first past the post election. Uh, without going into detail, what this means, and this is important, it means that in each district there's only one seat, and whoever gets most votes wins. Now this is a very bad system for a highly divided country. It works in the more homogeneous countries. Why? Because let's say there's this district and you have all these ethnic groups here. Only one ethnic group will get representation because it's only who gets the most wins. Now, if you would switch to a proportional representation, which, as you know, in each district, uh, each group would get uh, a number of seats in proportion to their weight in that district, to their, to their size in this district, in the, if they vote for their own representative only, that would be more representative. But the problem with this system is that it has the potential of disenfranchising many ethnic groups, especially the smaller ones. And that's a problem because, again, if you don't get protection and representation through these means, how else will you get them? Well, guess what? By forming your own militias. So this is why today, you have today, throughout, but today continues to be, and even more so, you have uh, a plethora of militias, re ethnic, regional, village. Why? Because there's the only way for you, for your interest and for your security, mostly to be protected, is to have your own militia. Why? Because the state is not functional. But the, because the state cannot guarantee that equal protection. And plus you don't trust the state, because you had the junta. So, there you go. Um, okay. So you have two assemblies, and then you have a president who is both head of state and head of government, which makes it a semi-presidential system. <coughs> but the president is not popularly elected, but is elected by the assemblies. And that's not all. Because, I told you, you will have both the, all these aspects, nation building, state building, and democratization reflected in this new constitution. So you saw how state building and nation building is reflected when we talked about how the state is defined, how citizenship is defined, the, 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 the political system. But how is democratization defined? Because if you have free elections, that's democratization, but the junta, is they, are they just going to throw out their power? No, it's a democratization process, yeah? transition from junta, authoritarian regime, to democracy. That process needs to be um, visible there. There needs to be mechanisms. And the mechanism is that the junta gets 25 seats, 25% of seats in both assemblies reserved for the military. There you go. There you go. 
Well, this is not new. If you look at the transitions to democracy in Central and Eastern Europe after 1989, you see that, for example, in Poland, the Solidarność, as it was uh, Solidarity, as it was negotiating with the communist regime, it had a similar arrangement, but there was an important difference. Uh, the communists there were not the military, yeah, so so they didn't have control of the tools of force of violence. Uh, so in the first election they had some um, reserve seats, if I remember correctly. I think maybe also in Hungary it was the same. And then in the second one it wasn't. They weren't reserved anymore. And anyway, it, in in the first election. Besides the reserve seats, they lost all of the others. So the point is that even with those, that reserve seats and managed transition in which you don't just kick them out completely, but you negotiate the transition so they're not too scared, um, they managed to be pushed out without backlash. Mostly because they didn't have the control of the tools of force, of power. Here, it's the military that has 25 percent of seats reserved for them in both assemblies and in the process of appointing the president they also are part of the nominating committee that nominates the candidates among whom the assembly the assemblies decide who is the president so you see how the junta reserved itself significant power now besides the 25 percent of seats in both assemblies in each assembly that the military has reserved according to the to the 2008 constitution they also have their own party that also competes in elections and also gets seats. <laughs> so there you go. What else does the military have? Let's, let's go on. The military also maintains control of the ministries of power, the power ministries, police, army, and so on, security forces. That is key, the key to disaster. Because what is one of the criteria of, of democracy? of liberal democracy, of a functional liberal democracy, besides free and fair elections, alternation in power, blah, blah, blah. None of which is fully, you know, working with reserved seats, but at least the rest are. Um, another key uh, demand in modern liberal democracies is uh, to um, have civilian control of the military because of this. Because the power of the state you know, the assembly makes a law. The president promulgates, signs it. But that law is only a set of words on a piece of paper unless it can become reality, which means it can be enforced. And it is enforced through the apparatus of the state, the institutions of the state, the civil servants, and to make sure that people obey it through the ministries, to the power ministries, to the tools of, to the legitimate tools uh, of state violence, which is law and order, yeah, uh, which is uh, court and police and military. And who could, now, for a go government to, do, to, do, to be democratic, the democratically elected people should be able to control the tools of force, because if those tools of force are not in their hands, they can pass whatever laws they want, they will not be enforced. Well, in this transition, the junta maintained control of that. Furthermore, the military continues to receive about 12 to 13 percent, I think, of the gross domestic product uh, goes towards the military, which is not, you know, as high as 50, 60 percent as, you know, in militaristic states, which is another, you know, concept. But um, it's, it's high. It is high. Um, so, so you see how um, this new constitution um, reflects the challenges and the situation in which Burma found itself in, in, and still finds itself and found itself in 2010-ish. But anyhow, you had some um, um, midterm elections sort of in 2012, but you had the, main, the first free elections 2015, won by Aung San Suu Kyi and her party, NLD. Second uh, party that uh, came in was Union, Solidarity and Development Party. You think of the name, who could it be? Yes, it's the Junta Party. 
still have these wonderful names. And all the other parties basically are ethnic parties, which again reflects the situation on the ground. However, the NLD won, and, and that's kind of where we can sort of um, count that the democratization process um, started happening. 2008, 2010, 11, 15. So the 2010 decade is a, is a period of democratization, and then, you know, the opposition takes over. Aung San Suu Kyi, so does she become a president? She doesn't. Because, remember, citizenship law. She cannot be president, she is a citizen, but she cannot be president because her husband and children are not citizens or were born somewhere else and are at least double citizen. And in a country so sensitive about citizenship, for reasons explained, she, does, she cannot become president, but she is the leader. I mean, there's nobody who, with her stature in Burma. So a, a new position is invented for her, state councillor. What is that? Well, that kind of becomes a sort of a prime minister. Uh, there is no prime minister in the constitution. Yeah, It's the same presidential system. But she kind of becomes de facto head of government, so in effect running the government, and the, presidential, the president more formal, because she's Aung San Suu Kyi. So you see how this is the fun and an interesting part in comparative politics, because things that look the same work completely different in a different socio-cultural context and historical context. You have reserve seats for the junta, you have uh, an invented position for who is the actual leader of the opposition, and she becomes the actual de facto head of the government, special counselor, state counselor. Also another interesting position, because okay, so now you have all these ethnic groups, the, especially the smaller ones who are not represented, this is the, the recipe for disaster, they knew that. And again, if you want to read the, the preamble to the Constitution, which are always funny, it kind of which define the space in which the Constitution takes place and talk about who are we, and you're going to see such interesting references to events, you now the context of 1988. Remember, it's the junta writing this. Complicated context, which is usually when people revolt against the junta. And also, you notice how they dance around the who are we? In the, in the constitution, in, in the definition of who are we, because what do you say? And again, I'm repeating this not because I'm arguing against, because, you know, I'm har harping on this, and oh, you're saying there's no Burma, there's no Burmese, and things are never that simple. You know, you can invent the thing, or invent, you can construct the thing, and it will become real, yeah? Um, I'm sure many people of different ethnic groups associate themselves as consider themselves Burmese, but there are also other ethnic groups which reject even belonging to Burma. There are others which associate themselves with the state of Burma that, but are dissatisfied with the situation of their ethnic group. There's all of this. It's like in Nigeria. Some people don't associate themselves as Nigerians, because what is that thing? I'm Fulani, I'm Hausa Fulani, I'm Ibu, I'm whatever. But some, I'm sure, will associate themselves with this state identity. So, Things are not that simple, but I'm just pointing out the challenges and the complexity of the situation. And what we need to understand in order for, for us to even think of um, paths towards a solution. Okay, so you have this process of democratization since the 2010s. And you're going to say, oh, well, that's great. Everything is solved. The opposition is in power. Freedom, peace, democracy, progress. Well, many things happen, uh, you know, because, you know, you have an opening to the world, you have uh, uh, economic, clearly economic benefits coming from this, but at the same time, uh, you know, the, the situation with um, the major challenges that I talked about, nation building and city building, they, they weren't solved by removing the junta. So you still have, in fact, you have an accentuation of an, uh, an increase in numbers of local and ethnic militias and groups and guerrilla forces, because now they're actually free to uh, propose their own identity. So you have nation building continuing at different levels. And you have social media, and you have, you know, social media becomes a vehicle for different groups who kind of lost a bit of their identity to regain it, because guess what? In this context and in this constitution, to claim identity, 
to claim to be a specific group also comes with political power. The same process is the same process of nation building in the 19th, 20th century. Remember, India, Burma, Ansan or Nehru or Gandhi, we need to say that we are a thing in order to claim statehood. Same thing now. We are an ethnic group in order to have what? Seats in parliament or whatever. Oh, and I wanted to mention this, um, this thing right in the constitution that um, there's also something called ethnic ministers. So in the regional state assemblies, because each state has its own assemblies and executive and whatever, um, there's, res uh, there's each, if in that state you have an ethnic group of about 50,000 strong, right? So not the majority in that state, in that region, but it's significant. They get to vote for their own ethnic minister who will have a seat both in the assembly of, of the region and in the executive. And formally, those ethnic ministers are supposed to run your own um, cultural affairs and whatever, but as one of the articles I will link will show, they don't really have resources. This is kind of like in Belgium. This is kind of like the Belgian model. But anyway, so you see again how the constitution tries to respond to the complexity of the situation. But anyway, so you have an increase in ethno-nationalism, competing ethno-nationalisms, because again, there's this guerrilla force, that guerrilla force. If you're a smaller ethnic groups in between these ethnic groups, both of them are going to oppress you and, and run over you. So you need to create your own armed forces. And <clears throat> there's some interesting quotes from different ethnic groups saying that if you don't have your own military force, you're nobody, that's the only way to protect your rights. Why? Because there's no effective state. Yeah? This is how important it is. Um, and, and then you have the Rohingya scandal or a, a tragedy that happens at several points in this past decade, but especially in 2017. And who are the Rohingya? Uh, the Rohingya are a Muslim population from the Rakhine, Arakan state on the coast, which remember the Arakan state, by the way, the Arakan army, one of the strongest ethnic militias who several times beat the national army seriously yeah just to tell you the balance of forces is <laughs> not in one uh, you know it's not weighing heavily on the for the burmese national army so in that the same state rakhine arakan there's this rohingya population of about a million maybe <coughs> used to be who Remember, um, we talked about who is citizen and who is part of Burma. Now, the narrative, the official narrative, that was promoted both by, and by, by the junta, but remained, was that the Rakhine are newcomers, that they came in during the British Raj. So they're not part of the constitutive uh, indigenous races, as they call them, ethnicities, we would call them, or whatever, ethnocultural groups, of Burma. So what are they doing here? And for various other reasons, they're not even given that second or third degree citizenship. In fact, the Rohingya have no citizenship, which in today's world, having been um, uh, stateless, meaning having no citizenship, is the worst situation in which you can find yourself. Because we're talking about the rights and whatever, the only, who do you go to to demand your rights? The, you can only ask for your rights to be respected. Or to, you can only demand things from an entity to which you belong in one capacity or the other. Yeah? Uh, so a citizen has a, a set of rights and obligations versus the state to which, the club to which it belongs. But if you're outside of the club, you have zero claims. And if you're outside both of that club where you find yourself and of the neighboring clubs, like the Rohingya, you belong to nobody. So there's literally nobody to whom, from whom you can demand except for some, you know, philosophical, moral ground, which I think is, you know, a serious ground, but legally ineffective. Nobody has any responsibility towards you. And that's the situation of the Rohingya. The worst. In fact, Rohingya were called one of the, the most oppressed group in the world at a certain point. But again, 
let's not be binary here. Oh, the Rohingya, oh, these, you know, the most oppressed, probably they must be angels. The Rohingya also defended themselves, attacked the army. So things are always complicated. Yeah, let, let's be clear. But in 2017, uh, as a result of some attacks on, on some border uh, or some army places by uh, Rohingya forces, there was this mass campaign against Rohingya by which literally they were pushed out of the country. Thousands and thousands, you know, genocide, ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is the actual word because what you happened is you cleansed that area of a certain ethnicity on the basis that they are, they are not part of, they don't have the right to be in that area because they're not part of the, of the constitutive body of the nation because they're not indigenous race. Now, of course, the Rohingya contest that, blah, 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 blah. 700,000 people up, or maybe a million, were forced to move to Bangladesh, where they don't belong. Yeah? Thousands and thousands died, mutilated, raped, massacred. During this democratic period. Now, of course, the army is still very powerful. The army did this, but famously, Aung San Suu Kyi, the hero of democracy, Shocked the world by the fact that she kind of remained silent when this was happening. Yeah, even if earlier during the at the beginning of the democratization process, she promised to include them as well. Blah blah blah. Well, without going into too much in-depth explanation, but you kind of perhaps can see why she remained silent. She's the daughter of Aung San. She's for democracy, but she is Buddhist. She's Bama. She's also a nationalist in the sense of nation building, right? Because it's not yet over. I don't know what's in her head, but I would assume that she, you know, it's, you know, the narrative of who is Burma is also her narrative. I would assume that Rohingya is not part of this narrative. Um... I would assume. But, you know, maybe she didn't want to, to, to anger the military. Military which was founded by her father, originally. Maybe it was also political, you know, things like, I can't go against, the, because I'm sure there is a prevalent opinion that Rohingya are newcomers who are a pest. I'm saying that's what I'm sure many people think, because that's, that's how it happens there. Yeah? And then, if this is the consensus in large portions of the population, this is the consensus in the country, you know, well, clearly they have no allies among other ethnic groups. My point being is that, without going, you know, because I don't have an insight into her mind, plus they're Muslim. And the conflict in Rakhine was between Buddhists and Muslims, and she's Buddhist. Right? And there were huge fights between Buddhists and Muslims in Ala Khan before that exodus. Conflict. Communal conflict. In which you know how communal conflicts go. It's these guys against those guys. Oh, and then retaliation. Who started chicken or egg? There's no end. And there's no end to the root cause. You can always point at, yeah, but they killed my mother. Yeah, but you killed my uncle. And both are right. That's the thing with this. It's not like, oh, but who is actually right? Well, do you think one of them are angels and the other devils? It doesn't work that way. This is what makes it complex, and this is why you need to find a creative solution. Or this is the, the art of politics. But anyway, the, 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 the Western media being shocked, and now you Google Aung San Suu Kyi, and oh, she tarnished reputation. She's hugely popular in Myanmar, uh, Myanmar still. By the way, the, 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 the name Myanmar was... Um, Changed from Burma by the junta in 1989. Uh, and now Burma uh, stayed. And the, why did they change? Well, partially also because it's less ethnic. Interestingly, yeah. Because Burma is related to Bamar, which is just one ethnic group. And Myanmar is and it's sort of pre-colonial. Um, Burma was called during the British Raj. And in the Anglo sphere, the Anglo governments call it Burma, other governments around the world call it um, Myanmar. Official name is Myanmar. 
uh, Republic of the Union of Myanmar. So, um, in Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi is tremendously popular. Fact proven by the le latest elections, the November 2020, where her party won, what, 80%, 70-something uh, 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 of, of the seats. And her as well, with her in, in, in you know, as the leader. She's hugely popular. So clearly, the positions she adopted are the positions of a majority of the population. Now let's look at these elections, the latest elections, um, which I will link in the, in the blog. Um, 2020, the NLD, National League for Democracy, had 61% of the seats in a, basically both houses, and the party of the army, USDP, Union, Solidarity and Development Party, blah, blah, which did decently in the 2015 election, although didn't win. Remember, these are not the reserve seats. The army has 25% uh, reserve to start with, but it also has its own party that runs for the other seats. The USDP, and here's the tragic thing for the army, only gets 3%. So crushed, which also shows you how popular NLD is. And that's a thing. That's very important because it means that there is this... Remember, there are only two parties in, in Burma that, um, mostly, that are important, that are national. Meaning that they have representation from across the country. All the other parties, which is very similar to India, all the other parties are regional and ethnic based, and they have you know one percent, one percent, one percent. I think that the um, uh, barrier to get into the parliament is 0.4 percent. But all the other parties, Shan, Kaya, Mon, Arakan, just you look at the, just listen to the names, are ethnic parties. They have you know uh, small. Um, so they have regional ethnic support. The only two national parties are NLD and USDP. Now, the fact that NLD obtained such a wide uh, support from throughout the country, which means that many ethnic groups voted for NLD, shows that, that there is support for a common institution, just like the Indian National Congress was at, at the time of independence. My point being that NLD can become a vehicle for nation building. With Aung San Suu Kyi even. Especially since, since, since she's related to Aung San. Of course, she's getting uh, on in age. Um, but the fact that ethnic groups trust this party, and then after the coup, after the recent coup, ethnic people came out against the junta, even if other ethnic groups are fighting the entire Burma as a project, shows you that there is a basis for, 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 for continuing nation building and NLD can can give the institutional basis for that. But for now, what happened after the election, two months after the election, February 2nd, as I said, there was this coup. And I linked uh, uh, in the blog um, uh, a video um, of... Um, there, there's some, some people doing these, uh, you know, aerobic, you know, workout video in the streets, and inadvertently they filmed as the coup was taking place, as the military convoy was going in. So, <clears throat> there's that video there as well. So, there's this coup by which the commander-in-chief of the army, um, uh, Klang, Min Aung Klang, with the army, arrested several elected people, um, sent Aung San Suu Kyi again to um, house arrest, uh, deposed the president who was elected, took over the government. Now, after 10 years of, slight of, of democratization process, why did they do that? Why now? What do I want to do? I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, I don't have the answers to these, but, um, and I, of course I don't know exactly, but it's a strange thing. What is the end game? Now, what did they say? They said that this is not a coup. We, the army, are here to, to protect the constitution. And that's what we're doing. And their argument is that, um, uh, that they contested the election. Why? Because their party obtained such few uh, seats. 
So they said the, the elections were rigged. Um, so, um, so, so they did some some contest. Cont they contested the uh, elections at the electoral com co commission. Electoral commission dismissed these uh, allegations. So they said the elections were rigged. So we came in to save the republic because the elections were stolen, more or less. And they said that we're going to be we're going to do a one-year emergency rule or military rule, emergency rule, I think it's called. And um, and then we're going to organize real elections. And of course, people rejected the whole thing because it was simply a return to the same old, same old. So what you've been having since then is still protests, hearkening back to what happened in '88 with with you know uh, civil um, they call it civil disobedience, which. In, for them means also um, a general strike. You have different professional groups coming out, organized as professional groups, the doctors, some, you know, I think teachers who are civil servants being employed by the state. You even have police in different regions, because remember, different regions are different. Some are ethnically different. Joining the demonstrators uh, or the anti-junta uh, forces. You have government repression, arrests being made. The internet was cut off. But here's the thing. What is the end game? What are they trying to do? Okay, you're going to have new elections and what? Are they going to get better results or are they going to manipulate the elections and then what? And then you're going to have international sanctions, which is the only way to go, by the way. Uh, but they need to be targeted and not to hurt the population. Plus, remember, the people now, why are they, you know, they came out, you know, hundreds, millions, uh, and, and uh, hundreds of thousands, millions in, in, on the streets. Why? Well, remember, this is, there has been 10 years of quasi-freedom. And so people who are now in the 20s, they, they, this is what they know. They know freedom. So for them, this is a shock. Plus, they have, you know, they have internet, they have social media, they have phones. Uh, even if the internet was cut, they can still communicate. They have access to information. Uh, the, the, the Burma, remember, was an autarkic, closed society, closed country from the world. It, it has opened. Um, so is there a way back? Right? Other people have said that maybe how about the lower echelons, the younger military, are they, do they agree with, 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 with what uh, this guy, um, I mean, Aung Hyang Hlaing did, he's an older, I mean, yeah, older person, uh, don't they want democracy, and some do, and some military do want democracy, what is the end game? It's a, it's a very strange uh, situation. Now, of course, the junta and the military has power, has, has you know, the tools of force. On the other hand, it doesn't have a lot. Uh, because, remember, parts of the Burma are not controlled by the military or are just controlled, you know, um, sort of um, hiring out or uh, buying control over different uh, uh, territories from local militias. Um, but they control the cities um, and the central government. Then NLD has tremendous support from all the strata and all the ethnic groups. So it's it's a strange situation. Uh, but I thought, I mean, we can continue talking about a thousand other things. But I thought that um, what was interesting here is to understand beyond the surface of the high, uh, you know, the, the, the highlights, the, the, the headlines in the news, uh, is to understand the deeper challenges that actually constitute what we what we refer to as Myanmar or, or Burma. And without which all the rest doesn't fall into place because you know, we're just surprised at all that Aung San Suu Kyi turns out to be also a nationalist. Well, guess what? Okay, so that was an interesting excursion into um, the, uh, a very interesting case study. Um, uh, and as I said, each, each episode will also have, a, uh, will have one or two major topics. This was one for today's episode, long enough. And also a smaller one that, in, uh, that we're going to talk about in a second. So, um, <clears throat> the... the Smaller topic um, to be to be addressed uh, today. Um, as I said, usually it's a it's a movie, it's a film, uh, it's a movie, it's a film. 
it's a it's a book it's a, or maybe it's just something interesting that I found uh, today is actually a couple of documentaries that I um, invite you to um, uh, look into if you want um, and they, these are called The Gatekeepers, which came out in 2012, and Inside the Mossad, that came out in 2017. Now, um, The Gatekeepers, you can find on various streaming platforms. It's available. Inside the Mossad was available until recently on Netflix. And both of these are documentaries. And the, the reason why I mention them together is because um, both are extraordinary. And both are extraordinary in similar ways. <clears throat> Uh, inside the Mossad deals with, unsurprisingly, the Mossad, and uh, the gatekeepers deals with Shin Bet. And Shin Bet is the um, sort of the counterpart of the Mossad. Uh, Mossad deals with foreign intelligence for Israel uh, and foreign operations, and Shin Bet is the internal security agency dealing with internal security, um, and uh, which also includes West Bank and Gaza. Yeah which also includes West Bank and Gaza. So both of them, tremendously powerful, famous. Although people probably know less about Shin Bet, but, uh, you know, at a certain point, it was way more important and powerful than, she, than Mossad. So what is astonishing and, and, and fantastic about these documentaries is that these are interviews with uh, heads, former heads uh, of Shin Bet, uh, and heads and top oper operatives of Mossad. Interviews that are not just interviews, but they're very uh, heart-hitting interviews, uh, very straightforward interviews, and the responses are also very straightforward. And this is what, what sets both of these apart, is the genuineness, well, well straightforwardness <laughs> of, of the dialogues that take part there. Um, and, and so I'm going to link them in the, in the, in the blog uh, for you to pursue. They are truly unique, a unique view behind. But I'm just going to point out, as usual, certain things that, that stood out, and I'm going to point out them out to you, and you might find other points as well. <coughs> First of all, um, the virtue of such uh, well-done documentaries is to um, dismiss or to... Um, uh, ratify this sort of a fog of the, or myth, yeah, this myth behind which all these organizations or institutions hide. I mean, for everybody, it was like, oh, it's CIA, it's the Mossad, is there some you know strange, dark, uh, 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 mythical? Because it's secret, because it's dark, it becomes mythical. It becomes, uh, you know, uh, this this um, superhuman almost or whatever uh, uh, sort of an entity. They're not. <laughs> not. They are institutions of the state. And as all institutions of the state, they are more or less effective, and they have a specific role for the state. Yeah? And what you will find behind the curtain is the human dimension, which often, I'm not saying in this case necessarily, but often is, just like in any other institution, mostly mediocre. Yeah? They're human beings. These are regular human beings. There is one scene or, or one, one part in um, The Gatekeepers where, where one of the former um, heads of Shin Bet says, um, you know, when I was a child, I was always had this impression, uh, growing up in a kibbutz, I always had this impression that somewhere in the capital, in the government, there is a long corridor, and at the end of the corridor, there is a door, and behind of the door, there is this old man who has the answers. Who, who, who takes decisions for the country. And this is kind of like the general perspective of normal, regular human beings on government. That there is someone there who knows what's uh, happening and uh, takes care of things. And usually they associate this with the head of state. Again, a hugely overblown um, uh, idea. Because the truth is, it's not like that. And it, as, the, as the head of the Shin Bet, uh, I'm not saying this idea is not helpful because otherwise people are, would panic and not sleep at night thinking that, <laughs> realizing the haphazardness of decision making and whatever, incompetence, mediocrity or just reg regularness, regularity uh, banality uh, anyway, uh, and the, this head of Shin Bet says, uh, when I grew up and I became a head of Shin Bet or whatever, or no, I was tra in training and I went to that building and I went to that corridor and there was no door at the end meaning that there's no 
you know, we always think that there's a big picture behind, and there's not. There are politicians who are elected and who take decisions in very contextual situations. Politicians usually are not deep thinkers, let's be very clear about this. Otherwise, they wouldn't be politicians. Yeah? They're not deep thinkers in the sense of, because that takes time. So usually politicians are not deep thinkers, even though they have some education or some, some deeper references, but they're not deep thinkers. They're Often they're just you know, getting in a position of power in a democracy or not just democracy, is a, requires a set of skills, getting elected. That doesn't mean that are different, those skills, than the skills of governance. Persuading people to elect you has nothing to do with being able to govern. Yeah? Just that. Just think of that. <laughs> and yet, we base one, we send people to govern based on their capacity to persuade people to get, to get elected. Two different things. Anyway, so, so one of the virtues of such documentaries is to, 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 to show the, 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 the real lived dimension uh, behind the myth, to dispel the myth and the, the, the curtain of fog. Uh, and there's nothing special behind that in the sense there are some interesting things, but they're not special or extraordinary. They're just interesting. And they're just like any institution, only with its own parameters. Okay, so uh, another thing is that, okay, um, is the, what usually is an interesting thing about these, these, uh, these institutions and these professions, Mossad, um, Shin Bet, uh, CIA, is, is the, the human toll taken uh, by this, this profession. In military as well. We all know about PTSD and so on. But there's, there's an equivalent here as well. Because uh, these are mostly covert, many of these Operatives are covert, not all of them. And many of them, their whole profession deals in falsehood, yeah? In lying, those who do such operations. There are many other people who just do regular stuff. Lying, um, pretending, and then being involved with quite uh, violent or, or um, having to take life. Uh, most of the decisions not being black or white. They all they state themselves. So, you, you know, there's... And then, but they're still human beings. So how do they deal? How do human beings deal with this? Now, the, the, the general narrative that comes across, these are different documentaries, but they have similarities. They have things that they do differently. But uh, the common narrative for, for people in these professions is, is patriotism. Patriotism or nationalism, not the same thing, but, but, but a sort of a, a, this duty towards the state that, or the nation, different things, that uh, sort of becomes the highest moral criterion. Now, of course, it's not. In reality, that is not the highest moral criterion. But for the ethos of these institutions, that needs to become those things that they ask you to do. But in reality, that is not the highest moral criterion. The nation or the state is not God. Yeah? or the highest good, or whatever you, know, you, you consider to be the highest good. It's not. But it is a good. And yet, in order to do certain things that clearly go against the moral law, and, and this is why they say, well, there's no moral law at that point. It's just you know, what serves the interest of the state or not. Because that's the purpose of these institutions, yeah? is to, to do specific things for, for the state. That the state needs um, to do. All of those are needed? All of those are justified? These are, this is where the questions start. And I'm not do, making arguments either or for or against. I'm just deciphering, understanding what's happening. So patriotism sort of is the, is the, is the cover. And the, the, but at the same time, these human beings, you know, um, you can't... There's this, there's this um, uh, story in, uh, in, in Inside the Mossad where um, this woman uh, uh, operative... Um, so she was undercover in some uh, Middle Eastern state and um, Arab state, and uh, uh, she pretended to be married to another agent. So they played the husband wife. They weren't. They were just two agents. They couldn't stand each other. They were very different. They hurt each other. But they had to pretend that they're married for, for months and months. The thing is, human beings are one. Unless you develop a sp split personality, which is a pathology, 
schizophrenia, whatever, that's 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 a disease. You yeah, you, you, uh, that's a, that's a pathology. Unless you go not, so to speak. You can't separate what you do now from who you are. You don't have different beings. Yeah. So guess what happens? They actually became a couple. Sort of by the force of the context. Not because they discovered that the other one was this amazing person. Probably they still didn't like each other. But they became a couple because you can't separate inside. And then when the mission was over, they were told by the bosses that they had to split. They had to break up. And she said, even if she remained in the Mossad for 20 more years, whatever, she never forgave Mossad for that. What a strange thing. Another, another um, uh, in both documentaries, different you know, leaders or operatives say that, you know, and then you go home, and maybe it's when you walk and you have a coffee or you're under the shower, and you did all those things that you had to do, in the name of the state, yeah, the state interest, the state cause, the nation, whatever. But then there's a moment when you ask the other questions. Is was this right? The, the, the weight of the actual moral weight of the of the deed weighs on you, and you can't escape it. And it will have an impact on you. And the best, I'm gonna make reference to another movie, I'm gonna also link it in the blog, uh, to another movie that does a fantastic jo- job of describing this, is and the movie is The Good Shepherd. It's a movie, it's not a documentary. It's an American movie, and it's about the, the, the formation and the, the growth of the CIA. It has Matt Damon, Robert De Niro, uh, Joe Pesci, some other guys. And uh, Matt Damon is the sort of the protagonist, and it, it shows the, the, the growth of the CIA through him. And there's this moment when he goes to visit a, a sort of a mob guy paid by Joe Pesci, unsurprisingly. Um, and Joe Pesci is on the porch, and he's with the kids, and, and then the kids and the, his wife, and they go into the beach, and he says to the kids, well, be careful, put the hat on, because the sun is... There's a scene of family. This is a mob guy, but he has a family, he cares about his children. And he's in a, maybe even a rocking chair on, on the porch, and Matt Damon sits down and uh, probably came for some information. And Joe Pesci looks at Matt Damon and says, you know, the Irish... The Irish had have the church. Uh, the us Italians have have the family. Uh, you, meaning Madame plays plays the, the, the wasp uh, Anglo sort of uh, sort of the devotee of the civic religion of the America of, of the state, right? His, this is America is his life is, is his moral project. Yeah, that's that's this is why he becomes. You know, the, part of the CIA and the, the CIA and uh, establishes the CIA because that, that's where, right, the, the state is the, the nation is the highest good, right? And it's America becomes a civic, a civic religion. But it's all implied, sort of thing here. And he, he turns and he says, And you guys, what do you have? <laughs> and Matt Damon says to Joe Pesci, says, uh, I think it's a paraphrasing or something, he says, Me? We? Or me? We have America. The rest of you are just visitors. Meaning, but what he expresses this is this identity defined by this civic reality or civil reality where the state or the nation is the highest good. Which is very telling. But and this is why the Good Shepherd is good because it shows the disastrous effects of, of a life that has to be dedicated to that God, so to speak. The disastrous effect it has in, on all the other aspects of his of his personal life. And again, I am not making an argument, I'm not making points. I'm just it's 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 an analysis, yeah. It's an I'm trying to understand. And right, these are necessary uh, institutions of the state with its with it, with their moral challenges. They're necessary institutions of the state within parameters. Uh, being grown-ups, being mature, means you need to be able to look at institutions, look at uh, reality, and understand it and see it as it is. And tell things as they are. Complex. Okay. Um, and uh, the final thing um, I will mention here uh, as, a, as a final note, these are just you know, uh, observations on, this, on these documentaries 
uh, there's one um, story or storyline in Inside the Mossad, <coughs> which actually later was made into a movie by Netflix. It's on the movie itself is on is on Netflix, a fictional movie, and it's a uh, which which sort of um, embodies all these conundrums that I mentioned. And it is about the Red Sea diving resort, and this is the story of um, uh, the Mossad. Uh, not setting up buying a diving resort by the Red Sea in Sudan, yeah, to use it over the years to run it fully as a diving resort. I mean, it was a tourist, it was featured in magazines <laughs> as, a, as a, one of the best diving resorts in the world, was run by the Mossad. Why? Because they needed to discover to side by side running this as a successful business and like for years. And also organizing the transports of Sudanese Jews. Now, what does it mean, Sudanese Jews? Like, like people from Sudan who are of the Jewish religion, because you know this is the Jewish ethnic, ethnocultural identity is a strange thing because it's actually a religious identity. That's what Jewishness means. Now, of course, it's also transmitted on maternal line, uh, and and only that. But it is a religious identity. So, ethnic ethnocultural groups have different criteria of definition. So you have Jews, right, but who are not the same Jews who came from Europe or from Russia. In Sudan, they're, uh, you know, black Sudanese of the Jewish region who then become Jewish, who then have to be helped to get to the new homeland of Israel. This is in the 70s or 80s. Yeah? And they organize a, a whole process of exodus, of transportation of thousands and thousands of Sudanese Jews, yeah, to the new home of Israel, all while doing this diving resort. And if you, I'm not going to go further into explaining the whole storyline, that, but it, things happen. And some bad things happen. And yet it's all done under this noble, even humanitarian idea of saving these, saving, well, evacuating these Jew, Sudanese Jews to their homeland. So you have all these strands of this kind of morality, that kind of morality, or lack thereof, and how they are played against, uh, towards each other and how all of this happens in a covert operation. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Okay, well, this was the second episode of our podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we will uh, see each other uh, two weeks from now on a Monday.